Well, it is 10 o'clock and um, we are recording, so I think we can get started. So good morning, everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome to our um, small group conversation about um, best practices for elder training. We've got a great group of folks who are going to share, who've uh, thought about uh, their ways of doing things and leading in the church. And so um, I'm going to begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this hour, for this time uh, together. God, we ask that you be with us in our conversation and continue to um, renew us and rejuvenate us as we lead your people in your church. In Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. We have a panel of, uh, of our panelists this morning, our guests. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to uh, just say their, um, their name, a church affiliation, congregation size, session size, and what county you are in. And we can start with Alex. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Alex Moses. I am at Fayette Presbyterian Church. I've been here for about 10 years. It's uh, in Fayetteville, Georgia, in Fayette County. A lot of Fayettes there. Um, our congregation <laughs> has right now about 275 members, I would guess, and we have um, a session size of nine. Uh, we used to have more than that, but we decided to uh, decrease the size a little bit in order to uh, to try to increase the quality, I guess, of um, all the folks that were on there. Um, nine is a lot easier to fill um, than 15 or, or 12. I think we had 12 before we drew down to nine, so yeah. That's Thank you. Olive? Um, my name is Olive Mahabir. Um, I'm the contract call pastor at Chris Presbyterian Church of Jonesboro. Um, my congregation is a little over 100 in size, and we've got a session of um, six members, and um, we're in Clayton County. Awesome. Thank you. Russ? Good morning. Uh, my name is Russ Weekly. I'm the pastor of Big Shepherd Presbyterian Church in Gwinnett County. Uh, we are right around 258 members and a session of 15. Hmm. Thank you. Shannon. Hey, good morning, friends. Um, I'm Shannon Dill. I'm one of the pastors at St. Luke's Presbyterian in Dunwoody. We're in DeKalb County. We are about um, 750 members, and our session is 26 members. Wow. Great. So, a lot of leaders. Juan. I'm Juan Herrera, pastor at Hamilton North Presbyterian Church, and we have about 150 members and a session of nine. Awesome. And Hodari. Good morning, everyone. Um, Hodari Williams, pastor of the New Life Presbyterian Church in the city of South Fulton in Fulton County. Uh, we have a uh, membership size of about uh, somewhere around 270 to 75, and uh, currently have 11 session members. Awesome. Thank you. So, we're going to roll through these questions, and um, the first one is kind of for everybody. And um, wanted to know, how often do you train your elders? How many sessions? Is it a retreat? What format? New elders only? Say a little bit about how you train your elders. Alex, you can start, and then we can kind of go through that little rotation. OK. Um, at, at Fayette, uh, we do most of our training on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and we do it in January, usually towards the end of January, um, at somebody's house. We get away usually from the church uh, and meet at somebody's house for an, a good long afternoon uh, and do, you know, a fair amount of sort of basic training, I guess, um, on being Presbyterian, about the Book of Order, uh, a little bit about, you know, what I'm responsible for as the pastor and what they're responsible for as elders uh, and then I give them a little time. Um, most of our committees have two elders assigned to them. 
And so I give them a little time to kind of meet and, and discuss their plans coming up and what they're responsible for, um, what their job descriptions are. Um, but then over the course of the year, we also uh, do some other things. Um, so our training is definitely not a uh, sort of a one-stop shop. It's, um, it, it's, it's a progression sort of over the course of the year and, and even over time. Um, because our elders do attend every year. Uh, it's not just for the new elders. Um, but then usually in July, we offer a, a leadership uh, training. We take a month off from our regular meeting and go someplace uh, and do something else that kind of gives them a little um, continu continuing education as elders. Um, and then usually in December, uh, we do something as a session. We don't we don't have a formal meeting that month, uh, so we do something purely social together in December. But um, but that's kind of the progression of our training over the course of a year. Thank you, Russ. So ours is in uh, a couple of different pieces, similar to Alex's. We actually start with a new officer event that is just for the oncoming elders. Now, whether they've been ordained or not before doesn't matter. Um, this is for anybody who's newly elected to session. And that's about a four hour event. Uh, it generally takes place at my house and we do that over a meal. Um, there is a, an assigned, it's about a 15 page book that we've created. Um, I don't know if I don't know if that screen, screen share is not allowed on our end, is it, Chip? No, we, we're look, we see it. Oh, okay. I, did, I didn't pop up on my end. I hope you're seeing the right, yeah, you're seeing the right screen. Yes. So that's the table of contents out of our elders, elders manual. Um, and it really covers everything from basic polity to how do we get along, uh, essential tenants, the questions they're going to be asked. This is in preparation for their examination. Mm -hmm. um, we then in January have a Friday dinner through Saturday uh, afternoon retreat, which includes our first session meeting of the year. We end that retreat with a session meeting. Um, that's a time both for elder training, for group building and bonding, uh, and for visioning for the next year or five years. Beyond that, we do um, a, an educational piece within each session meeting that usually is built around a book or some other topic so they They've been asked to read it ahead of time. Um, and then we show them videos instead so we can talk about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Juan? Uh, I do uh, a training for new elders uh, that have not been, that have not served in our church to, before and that that uh, pretty much they have not been like under my leadership. So we, we do that and it's about a three to four uh, days spread out at, at once a week for about an hour and a half. We do uh, different pieces uh, uh, and different videos, some from uh, Theo Academy and then uh, something that, that I started uh, was um, uh, breaking 200 barrier without breaking yourself by Carrie Newolf. And um, uh, we, I did that first with a session one time and then I just added to the other training. So we do that, um, they prepare a, a faith statement and then on the last session meeting in December, they, they come to the session meeting with all the elders and then they, press, they share their faith statements. Uh, they're installed in January and then uh, we have a session retreat uh, uh, sometime in the spring, late spring. And then as I see that I need, uh, then I, I'll do other pieces. On, usually on the session retreat, we, we uh, spend time uh, kind of flying the 50,000 uh, mile, just kind of overview of the church and what we really need to uh, focus and, and, and just refocus. That's awesome. Thank you. Alan. Aisha, did you say Alex or Ollie? I said, I, I said, I live. 
or you're did muted, you say Olive? Olive, <laughs> Olive you're muted. <laughs> Ollie was ready. To, he's not even, he didn't answer the questions beforehand, but he was ready to go. <laughs> but I, I answer to everything. Alex, Alice, you name it, I answer to it. Um, I've, I've kind of had a um, consistent pattern at First Jonesboro that's kind of worked um, for, for us. Um, typically, after elders are elected, um, we do the training and then the ordination and installation. And that's usually about um, two, two sessions and they're pretty extended. Sometimes they go for two hours, two and a half hours each. Yeah. So I make it an event where, you know, um, bring a brown bag lunch and, you know, and we talk about, you know, things that questions that they may have coming in. Um, so I, I make it very um, personable. Um, and I, I realize that these new elders coming in are always very nervous and they feel like, you know, they're very incompetent coming in. And so I take that time to ease their minds, let them know, listen, this is on the job training. Um, I still need to ask some people in my session, oh, does that need a motion? Um, you know, so I'm also continuing um, to learn. So we get that done. And then um, I, in the beginning, the first couple of years, I really strive to have um, a spring retreat and a fall retreat. And for the first two years, that worked really well. And they started looking forward to that like it, and an all-day retreat off campus and I realized everyone was very um very tired mm -hmm. and that was really filling them up yeah. um spiritually and you just emotionally um unfortunately that pattern kind of broke last year and coming into this this year so I'm trying to figure out what I could do for fall um, because I know they're really needing that this year. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of trying to figure out what we can do um, with social distancing and all those restrictions. Um, this year, I don't think I have any um, elders rotating off. I think the two that have served their first term will continue to serve um, for a second term. So I'll have to kind of reimagine what that training would look like um, going into next year as well, because I do want to do some kind of continuing ed. Yeah. One of the things we do um, during the year is, depending on what's happening in the news, um, mm -hmm. I choose a topic, especially if it's big events like what's going on now and that whole topic of, justice and things like that we would usually Olive I think we lost you is that just happening on my end she did breathe okay. yeah I would um, provide an essay or an article and then we'll come and discuss because I'm very you know careful in choosing what I the provide top. so that we can stay within you know um not, not to narrow the conversation but it would kind of give us some boundaries as where we go with the discussion um so that's kind of some of the things I do to keep them kind of keep the information new and fresh and keep them you know excited about the work that's great thank you uh Shannon Sure. So, um, like many of, of you guys, we do um, four or five afternoon sessions. Um, and we also, we have deacons, so we do these simultaneously. A lot of the information, you know, theology, polity, history, um, we, you know, obviously applies to everybody. So, we um, do that on Sunday afternoons and um, then we'll break up and, you know, diaconate specific and session specific information. And we do that 
you know, pretty soon after they are elected, which we do in January, February, um, the election. So they run basically the school year cycle rather than the calendar year. And then um, we have a retreat with all of the officers um, and spend a lot of time dealing, you know, with our mission and vision statement and, you know, where we find ourselves um, from year to year with that. And, um, and like um, Alex and Russ have said to, you know, try to build that around some community building and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing, like Juan, we, rely a lot on Theo Academy. So um, their resources have really proven to be helpful and useful in a lot of ways for us, so. That's awesome. I had only heard of that uh, more recently. So, um, which is great, especially in this, in this digital age, right? To right. say, hey, you know, let's watch this video together and then unpack that. Um, I think it's really nice to, to have that. And we'll talk a little bit more about resources as well. Um, Hodari, thanks, Shannon. But well, one of the things we do is uh, we train twice a year. And then, um, the first training is open to the new elders, as well as anyone who's interested in becoming an elder. Uh, so it kind of gives them an opportunity to be exposed to what it means to serve in the church as an elder. The second training is a retreat uh, that we engage in. Uh, it's usually off campus, two day retreat, uh, where we bring in facilitators as well as um, some folks who help us with team building exercises, um, and that's a time where we really, um, as a session, build our relationship together, uh, get a better understanding of the church history, policy, um, and really walk away from it knowing each other better. It's one of the things that I experience in the session that people really sometimes serve on sessions don't know the person they're serving with, uh, which impacts how the session works. So that's really one of the ways in which we build tremendously. Thank you. Um, could one of you, um, maybe I'll kick it back uh, to Juan. Um, how do you spend time on team building during, the, like, what are the some practical things that you utilize um, to, to build a, the team in the training, but also how do you keep that sort of team spirit? Um, uh, we start uh, the, a lot of uh, story lessons or, or story questions. Tell uh, it, it helps in two ways. It helps uh, us to know each other a little more and uh, build a team, but also to help them prepare for their faith statement. Wow. Uh, because not many have prepared a faith statement, and we have an option of doing a faith statement or a faith story. So. Uh, it's just walking through their faith journey and then uh, just kind of expanding from there. Um, and then uh, when it comes to uh, playing with a book of order, uh, we, we talked a lot more on, on, on how we work together uh, and uh, some of the exercises or uh, questions or problems that we can bring up with a uh, book of order, um, it just helps us just to see how we think uh, and so, so how, what to anticipate when a problem is rising. We, we start already knowing each other, how, how we're thinking, how we approach things. Uh, so that's, at least that's how we start uh, the, the kind of team building. Uh, and then praying for each other. That's one thing we do each uh, on each uh, time. We set up uh, each training session. We, at the end, we pray for each other. And, uh, and that's how we begin uh, kind of building that uh, partnership and, and, and teamwork. Thank you. Alex, I'm going to throw this to you since you've got that demon work on it. Um, how do you emphasize the role of spiritual discernment for elders um, beyond a business model of decision making? Um, well, in, in, uh, in my own research, um, what I tried to do was um, 
sort of take verbatims of, of session meetings uh, just before anybody knew, uh, knew anything of what we were doing. And as you would imagine, they were very, very uh, business-like. Um, and all the conversation revolves around the, the very nuts and bolts practicalities um, of uh, you know, some decision to be made. And so I, I tried a whole, a whole variety of things that you know, everybody normally does to try to interject some more spiritual dimensions into the session conversations. And that's really what it comes down to, uh, I think, is in the midst of a session meeting, does, does God ever come into, uh, into the equation? And, and rarely does that, does that happen. Um, but after I had uh, tried all these different methods and had them doing, you know, your typical devotionals and prayers and um, Bible studies and whatnot, I did the same thing, took verbatims of session meetings, and, and God still just as rarely came up after doing all of that stuff. <laughs> I, I kind of came to the realization, I think, that there's no, like, uh, sort of programmatic way of going about doing that mm. and I just it just finally you know fell upon my shoulders um that you know I'm I'm the moderator and I'm the pastor and sitting in the room uh on some level um I am the most clear reminder of of God being there in the conversation and I need to be very intentional about that um and just in the midst of a uh, some decision that needs to be made, uh, for example, we just uh, yesterday had our first little experiment with uh, an outdoor socially distant service. Um, but you know, we there's a lot of practicalities involved in that, and it's easy for the conversation to uh, kind of devolve into just pure well, who's going to watch the bathroom and who's going to make sure people are getting their temperatures checked and how many people are we going to have in the parking lot? But at some point, um, it still comes back to, is this something that we should do? Is this what we're called to do right now? Is this even safe? Um, and where, what is God leading us to do? And at some point then, I have to be intentional myself because I'll admit I'm a former engineer and I'm, I'm very much into the practicalities of things. Um, but I have to stop and say, but at the end of the day, is this something we're supposed to be doing? Um, and where is God in the midst of this? And be, you know, intentional about asking the session that question in the middle of their conversation. What do you think God wants us to do here? And, and just after they talk about that a little bit, maybe say a prayer about it. And, but it, I have to be the one who very intentionally brings God into the equation, and that's my role. Um, and my personality is to try to do things programmatically to get that to happen, but it just didn't work uh, in all the research I did. And uh, it, it comes back, you know, in my perspective, to the pastor, just bringing God into the equation, uh, being intentional about that in the middle of a meeting, which is... It's a hard thing to do sometimes, but being self-aware and aware of the conversation and making sure God gets brought up. That's awesome. That I, was, I, love, I love that. I love that imagery. Um, Joy, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but did you want to say a little word about discernment and some of your work around that? She's on mute. I'm on mute. I'll say it so everyone can hear. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what you would like me to share at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love your postures. And so I just, I just thought if people didn't know as a resource, that's all. I do have an article that I've written uh, about the postures for spiritual discernment. Um, just really um, exhorting our, our leaders towards just exactly what Alex is talking about in terms of how do we go from being, uh, this is a business meeting, um, get her done, to how, how do we make um, room for the spirit? What postures do we need to incorporate in our work together um, to, to be fostering um, spiritual discernment as part of our work? Thank you. Thank you.
I just, I, again, the, what are the images that we can create for our leaders to say, you know, again, as a pastor, that you're reorienting them, that God is in the decision making. As a leader, what posture, because there's a lot of different ways people um, can, can respond or be really rigid when it comes to trying to make decisions as spiritual leaders. Um, Joy, there is a request to say if there's, um, if you can share the link, I, I think that's something people would, would love to see. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Aisha, if I could jump in on this just with Please. a quick comment. Yeah. Um, for us, one of the things that I'm constantly trying to do with our session is remind them they're not there as managers, mm. they're there as leaders. Mm -hmm. and, and then redefining the difference for them that to be a manager means you're making sure you're doing things the right way. To be a leader means you're making sure you're doing the right things. Mm. Mm. And that's, that's where you, you know, as Alex was using in his illustration, that's where you then have the opportunity to say, let's bring this to God in prayer and say, are we on the right track? Right. That's right. And Aisha, can I have one more thing? Please. Uh, we do have uh, one, one session meeting during the year, usually our May meeting, kind of the end of, you know, a lot of the church calendar also revolves around the school calendar. So May kind of enters into a lull. Um, but usually in May, we also take a meeting just to evaluate um, mm -hmm. some of the things we've been doing over the course of the year. And that particular meeting lends itself much better to some discernment about, like Russ said, about are we doing the important things? Yeah. Um, because even that meeting can turn into just, you know, uh, tightening up the nuts and bolts a little bit. Uh, but to make them step back and say, is this particular mission something that we still feel called to do? And why or why not? Is there something else we're called to do instead? Or um, some of those higher level kind of uh, conversations. And Aisha, can I interject there too? Um, I, we do that same sort of processing, Alex, so I find that helpful. Um, and also for larger sessions, it's helpful and probably for smaller ones too, but that's, this is the animal that I am, you know, wrangling. But we do a lot of small group breakout conversations that are guided along some of those same lines that Alex has um, mentioned. So we find that very helpful in the discernment process. I think it's really, it's really important. Um, and I love the idea. Of, Aisha. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, one, one of the things that I found to be resourceful, um, particularly in our context, I married two texts together, uh, Joan Gray's um, text that deals with spiritual leadership, uh, as well as the spirituality of African peoples by Peter Paris, um, because it's, it's important in our context uh, to really hone in on the spiritual component of what it means to be uh, an elder. And we always want to evaluate what we do if it's rooted in prayer. And this is a very challenging thing to do, but we try to do it to make sure that we give our elders an opportunity to discern. So decisions that we can make that are not, um, that do not need to be made immediately, like in a situation of a, you know, an emergency, uh, we provide them with adequate time to sit with it, pray about it, think about it. What is God saying? Um, and then come back to our next session meeting and let's discuss it. What have you heard God say to you about this? And that has really taught us a practice of, of prayer and discernment around critical issues for, for the church. So we're not showing up to a session meeting and making decisions right away. We'll present information on facts and detail and ask people to sit with us, pray about it, and uh, see where God is leading you uh, in those particular discussions. Now, God doesn't always lead everybody in the same direction, um, <laughs> but that's been my experience. Um, and God doesn't say the same thing to everybody, but um, it does create an atmosphere where we are really trying to about hearing uh, and listening for God before we make decisions. That's awesome. I, um, I had the honor of taking a class with, with Peter Paris. I think hearing you mash up those two um, leaders and any links you can send us later would be great. It's just also a reminder that even your, uh, your context, right, whatever the cultural or demographic, you have to keep fine tuning for your particular context and how uh, the folks that you shepherd are used to making decisions 
And so what, what is unique to your particularity? So I think that's a great mashup of Joan Gray and Peter Paris, um, such wise voices um, at, at a place like New Life. I think that's awesome. Um, if, if I may just say one, one thing, it's, yes. it's uh, similar to, her, to what Horaya was saying. What I uh, use, what I brought to our church, it's a, a more of a three uh, sessions discernment process. So if, there, if I know there's a hot topic or if in one session meeting, just something is just causing a heated discussion, um, then I uh, kind of stop it and say, I think we need to take a few session meetings to talk about this. And then on the next session meeting, I send them beforehand uh, conversation or, or information about the topics that we're talking mm -hmm. on both sides so that they can have time to read, educate ourselves, uh, pray, but it gives us time to also start a conversation uh, that sometimes we just come to session to, to argue. How's that? What's the theological um, <laughs> definition? Yeah. What's the Greek for that, right? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but af after we do uh, the three so it's three months, pretty much. Yeah. After the third time, um, the, the one thing we have to do is whatever decision we make, we all have to agree because we are the one body of Christ. So we try not to take a vote where we are in the, there's, even if there's one in disagreement, then the spirit is telling us something. If, we, if nine people cannot come uh, together as one body and one understanding, then maybe it's not the, the right time to do it. Wow. We'll, we'll postpone it for six months later, nine months later, or maybe is the thing that it just, just doesn't apply to our church. Um, and uh, we've used it probably at least three times. Um, and, and that is just a reminder. We are leaders, like uh, Ross was saying, we're leaders, not just managers. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a really, that's a really powerful um, approach. Um, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's so many things in my head I'm, and I have like 20,000 more, <laughs> 20,000 um, more questions. Um, I mean, you know, I do appreciate the ability for Presbyterians to dissent, to put things in writing, but when it does come to hot button issues, that is a question like, do we need to be a little more, together um, if we're making something that's a huge shift or a, sh a huge movement um, um, in the church. The next question um, is sort of asking more specifically, um, Juan, you touched on this about um, elders um, sharing their story or journey. Um, I'm gonna kick this to Shannon. If there are, there's a resource that I use, um, but I'm curious what resources that you may have used or utilized or um, to get to tease out um, the stories of, of your elders and, and help them to make sense of who they are in their spiritual journey. So um, perhaps interesting, we, um, we started basing this process, part of the process off of what we do with our confirmands, right? Okay. So, so um, over the years, we've just established um, some questions, you know, like Juan um, had alluded to in the chat that, you know, just some probing questions about, you know, even taking the, you know, the, the good old lifeline, you know, and where was God in these instances and um, where it, you know, and some, when I say it out loud, sometimes it seems like, oh, well, that's what you do with teenagers, but our, our adults, because I think that um, I, someone said it earlier, that they come in feeling very pedestrian when it comes to, to spiritual leadership. And so we kind of ease them into it that way. Um, and we have, we, we honestly use the exact same outline that we use with our confirmands in that process. And then we, um, depending on timing and size and that sort of thing, we have them share those aloud with one another. Right. You know, the story is we, we encourage them not just to have the story as something they process, but then how do you share that story with others? And which is, as you can imagine, very team building because people then can resonate and relate. And and sometimes, you know, we all have that one elder um, who is a little complicated, right? <laughs> 
And Later. sometimes, yeah. sometimes <laughs> when we sit in a room together and hear their faith story, you begin to understand who they are and and where they come from. And, and so it really, that process is incredibly helpful. It's perhaps one of the best things that we do um, in, in terms of getting our elders outside of themselves and into what it is we've asked them and God's called them to do. So, and I'm happy to share that with folks. Um, yeah, the, that, would, that would be great. And, and again, like we said, after um, following the follow-up or recap from this conversation, we'll have this video as well as other links. Um, Shannon, the, the line where the up and down, um, I, when I became a Presbyterian, they brought that out. And, and that comes from uh, <laughs> Richard L. Morgan's book, Remembering Your Story. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yeah. That's, that's where the, the, the straight and the squiggles, well, I use that everywhere. I get everybody's story. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. Get out the paper, draw the line, the yeah. positive side up top, the negative side underneath. And it is amazing how you get to learn um, stories. I was also part of a session where each time one of the folks would share their, their faith journey in a session so that you kept hearing stories um, throughout the years that the people were on. And so I thought that was a really good way of, of reminding people of their connected part, um, connectedness. Other folks, are there other, um, any practical sharing your story um, books that you all have used? I'll kick that back to Russ. There's not a particular book that we've used, um, but what we do is as part of the elder training uh, retreat, there of course is the, is the story sharing time, but we do it kind of like Shannon said, we drop back to their youth group days um, and we're playing games of, for instance, to tell the truth. Many of you may have heard that, heard that game, but you, you come up with the wildest story. It has to be true of one of your elders. You've broken them up into small groups. So three of them are telling the exact same story as if it were true of them. It's only true of one of them. Yeah. But it's usually of their wilder days yeah. um, or, or something that's outlandish, you know, and, and it becomes both entertaining and very revealing. And that helps break down some of those walls of, wait, we're here to be in this spiritual uptight place. Yeah. Um, also, games like to tell the truth, um, two truths and a lie. Yeah. So, you know, give us two things about yourself uh, that are false and one that's true. And we have to try and guess which is which. So that's a way that we elicit some of the the other part of their life stories that they're otherwise going to be reserved about. That's awesome. Thank you. Aisha, I would like to share one too. Uh, one of the things that, um, and I've had the privilege of being able to do this with the leadership team at Snapchat, and I brought it back to, uh, brought it back to uh, New Life this past year is counsel. Um, we engage in a practice called counsel. And in that, in that practice, uh, we share story um and faith journey and but it's done in such a way that we're very cognizant of the space we take up um in those settings um and then it, it also engages us in intentional listening um because it involves a talking piece um so your attention is always on the person who is speaking and you don't um you're not worried about being the next person so you're not formulating your response uh, while someone else is uh, speaking. So it, it has proven to be very helpful in this year because of the um, age demographic within the session changing. What we did do was an inner council where the younger folks listened to the older folks in the group and then they moved to the outside and listened to the, um, the elders in this and I mean the younger people in the center. Uh, so it really got <laughs> really got to be a really good experience and I think we'll, we'll revisit it and anyone who's interested in that um, uh, council um, piece I can share resources with you but also some of the training uh, that is out there that, that proves to be very helpful and beneficial. Well, Dara, that's great um, this is I mean again that's why we're doing this let's get um, get wisdom from each other I love that image of even in physical space where the po folks that are being listened to are kind of inside that fishbowl and the folks outside um, are around them. I think that's awesome. Um, some of you have list, listed um, books already. Odar, you said you have this mashup of Peter Paris and Joe Gray and other, but can you, and 
um, Shannon, you talked about Theo Academy. Are there, uh, is there a book or a video or a podcast that you utilize in your training? Um, so, well, I do have to say that Theo Academy is probably our number one resource. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, it's, um, it's free and it's well done. And, the, um, and they do have study questions they're developing to go along with it. But they also have for um, new member training, they also do some, you know, um, Bible study approach videos as well. And that truly, y'all, that's, we rely on that heavily for um, new members and for officer training. And we kind of, you know, mix and match, of course. Um, and the, one of the benefits of those in, in regular days is that people can go back and rewatch. Right. Or if they couldn't attend, they can watch it and, and then at least be caught up on the conversation. Um, but I, I honestly, that's our number one go-to. Um, and then also Joan Gray's Sailboat Church, as Hadari has mentioned, is, has proven very useful for us. Um, and then on a different level, um, especially with our um, deacons, I encourage them to listen to Brene Brown's podcast that she started when um, Shelter in Place started. Um, so... And I commend that to anybody. It, she's fantastic. I think there, there she does use some salty language. Is, there's, <laughs> there's, there's my disclaimer, but, um, but I encourage anyone to listen to that. So I had not. I was not aware that she started one of, of, for this season. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's excellent. Yeah. yeah, and you know she does so much work on vulnerability, and um, and she spends a lot of time, you know, having guests talk about that. It's good stuff. That's great. Um, Hodari put in the chat, Unstuck Church. Um, Hodari, do you remember who's that, the author on that? Tony Morgan. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. It's okay. Um, the two that I seem to always be coming back to, um, some of you have probably put on your in your library and kind of moved on from it, but um, I, re I, I keep going back to Select It to Serve. Mm -hmm. um, Earl S. Johnson, because um, I, I, I feel like there's, you know, there are some chapters in that book that breaks down the information really well, um, and it really opens up discussions um, among, among elders, new and um, returning. Yeah. And I also, um, Presbyterian Beliefs by Don McKim, yes. um, that has an amazing way of um, teaching the, the, the doctrines and reform theology. It's an excellent source for introducing reform theology and, and all that we believe. That's awesome. Um, Alex. You're, You're on mute, Alex. Um, I've used actually uh, three different things uh, over time, kind of depending on what's going on in the congregation at the time, but um, there is, uh, you know, the old uh, Edwin Freeman stuff. Um, and, but he, he actually has one that, it, that has a little DVD version of it called a uh, reinventing leadership um, and about sort of, sort of maintaining your, um, I don't know, maintaining your composure when, when things are getting a little tense, uh, in decisions you're making or uh, in the life of the church, um, you know, kind of uh, dealing with the, you know, the anxiety that can build up in a church over issues. Um, and then another one, a lot of us have used the five practices of uh, fruitful congregations, um, I think is a great way just to get, uh, again, to get elders to start thinking about bigger picture things going on for a congregation, sort of what is our purpose in life here um, as elders. And then the one that we did at our, um, whatever whatever we called that, Aisha, the, the little book club, uh, was, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Um, our baby book club. Through that, um, our, um, have all been helpful uh, definitely at different times. And, uh, and as we, we found in our presbytery conversations, the, the five dysfunctions of a team, which is uh, Patrick Lencioni, um, and he's written another 
pretty good one too. But um, death by meeting, I think that one was called. Yes. Five, five dysfunctions <laughs> is very easy to apply to uh, a church and especially working with a session. Um, it, the, the different categories that they have are pretty easy to apply uh, for a conversation. That's, I'm, I had to laugh out loud. I haven't read Death by a Meeting, but I was like, I got to get that. <laughs> Great title. I don't kill anybody. That's, that's amazing. Chip has something. Can, can I suggest something that, that uh, I found helpful when I was doing officer training? There is, uh, there was, I don't know if it's even still in print, a book called Please Understand Me by mm -hmm. Kiersey and Bates, but it had a shortened version of the uh, Myers-Briggs uh, mm. personality disorder. And I would send that to officers ahead of time and have them complete that and get it back to me so that I could score it and see how they um, tested. And then um, just talk as a group about the different personality types and um, uh, to help them to understand how different people process information differently. And, yeah. you know, someone who thinks differently than you do isn't being difficult. It's just a different way of thinking. So I found that that was helpful to help people understand interpersonal uh, communication. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's, it's so helpful. Um, Juan, did I, did I miss you? Did you have a book? Uh, I have a couple of resources. Uh, one is Serving as Ruling Elder okay. from the Presbyterian Leadership, pre, the PresbyterianLeader.com. Um, and uh, it has very good basics just to start off and uh, give to elders. And that way you can expand from, 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 from the, that information. But it's a very good summary of what they do. It's like three or four documents in, in there. Yeah. And then the other one is uh, breaking 200 without breaking you, right, right, without right. tearing you off, and um, it's uh, it, it starts with the analogy of uh, comparing a, a, a pop a, a mom and pop shop yeah. to Walmart, yeah. uh, and and what is it? How are we doing the church? Are we trying to keep just the pop and mom shop? Uh, and even as, as we grow, we still try to keep that same kind of leadership, but as we grow, things change. So uh, it's a good transitioning piece uh, into helping the elders take ownership of their roles yeah. um, and also encourage to get their volunteers to take ownership. That's all, I think that's awesome. Folks are us. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Odari. Uh, and Juan, that brings me back. That's familiar. That's similar to the uh, Unstuck Church. I, how many of you are familiar with that? I don't want to talk about it if you already know about it. No, give us the wisdom. We need okay. it. We um, <laughs> <laughs> the Unstuck Church is a a book that uh, really looks at um, churches as a living organism, and it, it talks about the life cycles of the church. And what I asked the elders to do prior to our retreat is to read the book on their own, not to discuss it, um, and come to the session meeting telling us where you think the church is in its life cycle. Um, and created, and I brought this from a friend of mine, Dr. Matthew Wesley, who is uh, the uh, now president at ITC, we created that life cycle on the floor. Um, and at the beginning of our retreat, we asked all the elders to come in and stand in the area where they had um, anticipated where the church was and they all stood in the same spot and it was such an eye-opening um experience for them to be able to see that they all were thinking the same thing in uh reading that book but it really helps uh to understand and to also uh bring them to the table with a sense of um care uh compassion for the church and then also somewhat of a sense of urgency um, um to determine whether or not they want to do hospice ministry or they want to engage in um, creating and birthing something something new. That's right, thank you. Um, we're getting a couple more um, resources in the chat. Uh, Stephanie Bishop said that she's done an online quiz for uh, determining conflict styles. Uh, Jane Hubbard has a um, devotional 
on discernment um, process. Yeah, I would dump it in the chat. And Joy um, is just reminding you all that, you know, the Presbytery is here to be a support and the Shalom team can facilitate um, communication and conflict styles um, and even developing a session covenant, which I think is great. Alex, I'm going to let you say what you just typed because I can't. <laughs> okay. um, I, this has been one of the, those COVID things. Um, I did uh, a course through Emory University about, it's another, um, like Chip was talking about the Myers-Briggs stuff, but there's another indicator called DISC, D-I-S-C, um, that is a little less behave, a little less um, personality driven and more sort of behavioral um, decision making, how you process things, how you get work done kind of stuff. And um, using that, I, it was funny because I, I had noticed in particular that our, our church treasurer and I have very different ways of processing things. And um, I tend to be um, a D in the system, which means I am very sort of task goal oriented type person. Um, and our treasurer is a classic um, accountant and is very, very uh, detailed, needs a lot of time to process things, has to have every last bit of evidence lined up before they'll make a decision. And it was driving me nuts. And, um, but as soon as I took this, I said, I get her now. You know, I, I know um, because I talk about not only are you a D or you, a, she's a C, um, but it, it also helps you realize how can, if you are these two different things, how can you actually work better together understanding that um, and knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are and, and kind of, you know, what are the ways, what, what buttons do they need to be pushed um, to kind of uh, encourage them, uh, you know, to whatever motivates them. So it, it's really kind of a neat uh, indicator, the disc system can you i remember uh, taking that i'm sorry who was saying something i, I was trying to jump in on Al, on the end of alex there oh. um when you're talking about the disc the other one to look at is the piav um the disc tends to focus on how like you said it's behavioral how people do things the piav is more of the attitude assessment it's why they do things uh and in combination those can become very powerful if you guys could throw those links in the chat, um, I think that would be awesome. Cassandra, did you want to say something about DISC? She just put something. Uh, I was just going to echo what, what uh, Alex said. We did that several years ago with the Presbytery staff. It is a great resource. And so I just wanted to say an amen. To Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Alex, can you remind us what the... Um, I, I know D is for dominant, I think. But remind us what the acronyms, what the letters stand for. Do you remember? Oh, wow. Uh, no, but uh, <laughs> it's on Google. And there's also a free, you can get free little simple assessments that obviously aren't, I mean, they're online. You just go on and you fill it out online and it shoots you immediately back your, uh, your area. Um, but yeah, it's free and it's simple. It's not quite as in-depth as if you obviously go to a, a trained person, but that gets very expensive. But you can do a very free little assessment and get your category back in 10 minutes. And it's, it's pretty accurate um, compared to doing the very extensive, very thorough one. Uh, even the cheap, even the free online version is pretty accurate. Um, I, I and thought it was a little description. To know that, yeah, I think it's like dominant influencer safety and conscientious or something like that. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Steadiness is the S. What is it? Steadiness. Steadiness. Yeah. Um, I've, I've thrown in the chat to everybody just a, a little one page sort of um, Cliff Notes version of understanding each of those. We also didn't talk about the Hartman Values profile, but there's just some information for folks there. Can you just say two sentences about that? Um, the Hartman values, let me bring it up so I can speak intelligently on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how, what, and why do we and should we value huh. is what that one's looking at. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, 
Next question. Um, how do you explain the elders' role in councils and their role in being part of the connectional church? Russ, I'm going to let you lead with that one. Well, for me, that's, that's one of the joyful pieces because it helps them understand, the again, the difference between leadership and management. Mm. That God has called them mm. to be a leader in this environment. And for us, one of the big emphases, uh, we tried to do a startup program that we called Lead Like Jesus and it lasted for about two years and sort of fell apart on its own, under its own weight. But, you know, their role as an elder is not to get the work done, it's to call others into ministry. And so as we're looking at what does it mean to be the council of the church, the authority for the, the body of Good Shepherd, their call by God has also called them to use those same gifts, talents, and abilities throughout the church. So they are called to serve at Presbytery, at Synod, at General Assembly, at whatever level of council that they are invited into. And that's how we approach it. I love that. Um, I'm going to go to the next one. Um, I'm going to give this to um, Olive. How do you train elders in practicing spiritual disciplines? Um, that was one of those questions on the um, <laughs> on the questionnaire. <laughs> that had me sit back and think for a moment. Yeah. Um, I think by encouraging um, and, and practicing it in, mm. in session meetings. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also, but also um, having a continuation of that from the pulpit. Mm. And, in, in other aspects of the church's life. Yes. Um, I, and it kind of goes hand in hand with what I do with the, cre the, the creeds and confessions. We talk about, you know, briefly talk about the historical context of each, but then um, I introduce each creed um, and confession to the congregation and we use it for one month. Wow. And, Olive, we're losing you. Yes, yeah, so that they could become acquainted, um, you know, with that as well. Be and, and see it kind of, and live into it during worship. So it's not something that's abstract, but it's something that is connected with our faith. Um, so I try to incorporate some of these in worship um last year we talked a lot about silence mm. you know um and you know during the pastoral prayer time in worship we practiced silence we did some and, and that was you know a lot of people i had some mixed reactions <laughs> for that you mean it just love <laughs> but you know for me it's kind of a test you know let me see how far I can push this yes um but yeah it's about starting a discussion but it's also about you know showing how what this looks like in a worship context as well thank you others want to chime in on spiritual disciplines I, I enjoyed some of your responses. One person said, if they don't come in with them, you really can't train them. <laughs> Alex, I'm going to let you have that one. I know that's a Joy's phone number. What's that? I just give them Joy's phone number. Uh, you dime me out. Hey. Um, hey. Yeah, because I always have a conversation with our nominating committee, and it always, and no matter what, well, I always tell them, you know, you want to, you want to choose folks that are active in the life of the congregation. And if, if you choose somebody that doesn't come very often, then what's going to happen is they're not going to come to session meetings either. They're not going to suddenly change and become different people. Mm -hmm. They're not going to get their committee stuff done. That's going to frustrate people around them. It's going to, I mean, I've had um, in a previous church, we just didn't have vacation Bible school one year. 
um, because the elder just didn't do it. Um, and so then, you know, then you're fielding complaints about it and all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, why did you put this person on, uh, you know, on session? And, um, and so I tell, I tell the nominating committee that, but without fail, we will have somebody on the nominating committee still recommend somebody to be nominated and say, well, I know they haven't come very often, but if they get on session, that may be a great way to get them more involved in the life of the church. I mean, wow. Um, but, um, you know, so I, I do, I definitely lean in that direction that if you get, if you bring somebody on, they're not going to suddenly become different people. Um, we can certainly encourage them to engage in these practices. Um, and I, most of the people that, that I've had on the session, um, as they've rotated off, you know, and they've, a lot of them have been elders before, they've been elders under other pastors and whatnot. Um, and so I usually feel pretty good that when they rotate off, they say often that they actually kind of enjoyed their time on session and they grew during that time because of the things that we were doing together um, because of some of those built-in spiritual disciplines. Um, but I think if somebody comes on and they're not, they're not going to any kind of Sunday school class or Bible study or something, there's no way they're going to just, you know, it's just not very likely they're going to all of a sudden start uh, because they got on session. I think uh, they're on session because they're already spiritually mature people and they're doing those things uh, mm -hmm. already. Thank you. It is, it is, uh, I was going to uh, go to you, Hodari, actually. Can you say more about, you said something earlier about people who were interested in being elders, that, that they're kind of in proximity with those new elders. Just when it, just say a little bit more about spiritual disciplines as, as well as this onboarding um, or if people who are interested. Yeah, so, so New Life is not, um, is not historically made up of folks who grew up Presbyterian. Um, so, I mean, we do have the folks in the congregation who like to taunt and walk around. I'm third generation Presbyterian. Um, and then we have folks who just wandered in off the street from various denominations and found out that there's a black church in their community and have joined. Um, and they come to the context with a different understanding of what an elder means. Um, an elder in their context is someone who is very spiritual is a spiritual leader in the church and provides that to the congregation. So when they witness um, session operating in a certain way, those folk tend to drop to the background. So uh, they're hard to get to, to participate, um, to come. But what I found out is when we open that uh, training to anyone who's interested and in that opportunity, I get, I get the opportunity to share what it really means to be an elder in the Presbyterian church. It's not about voting and making decisions and, and managing, as, as was said here on the call, but you're really a spiritual leader. Um, of the church. And what I've also conveyed to the elders is you can't be a spiritual leader if you're not spiritual. Um, if, you know, a lot of people, um, and I, I'll be honest, a lot of people in the congregation who uh, have gone to Sunday school, go to Bible study, and I just wonder sometimes if they've ever talked to the Lord, um, you know, if this has spent any time with God. Um, so in those moments, explaining um, and giving them an opportunity, and, you know, there were so many elders who just didn't know how to pray. And that was strange, um, you know, uh, didn't know how to, in, to engage in care for the congregation. Um, but I know a lot of that comes from those spiritual practices and in your own Space, engaging in contemplative practices. So what I try to do is share with them resources um, around prayer, around meditation. What are you doing in your personal time? What are you doing during the week to, to, to feed yourself, your spirit? Um, and when you do that, it, 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 it gives you a toolbox um, uh, of resources to be able to draw from when you engage the congregants um, in the church, when you find yourself in situations where someone pulls you aside and says, elder, you know, I'm dealing with this particular situation and you don't have to come running looking for me, um, you can really engage that parishioner at that moment uh, because you have the resources. 
So engaging them and, and giving them an opportunity to do that. One thing I didn't say that we do in our training is I allowed, uh, the, I asked the elders who have been on session to participate with me in the training. It gives me an opportunity to see what they've retained, what they have actually understood um, in the process. And then there's that peer uh, piece because I don't want it to get too focused on, on me as an individual, but I think the cross-pollinization of all the people in the room uh, becomes becomes helpful. But I am I'm really amazed, and I just because I come from a various, uh, you know, I grew up Baptist and Pentecostal. I became Presbyterian in seminary thanks to Dr. Margaret Amar and and others, um, and Melba Costin. But I'm always amazed at the folks I encounter in leadership positions who don't really see that uh, spiritual piece as the necessary component. They were trained in such a way that it was really about the book of order and the polity and making decisions and keeping the church in check and the pastor in check, um, as opposed to the care for the people. Um, and I think now that that's really shifted because those spiritual pieces have come into place. And I'm, I'm seeing it blossom in so many ways, particularly at New Life. Uh, and those folks who are not Presbyterian are now wanting to be um, because they have a different view of what it means to be Presbyterian. Yeah, I, thank you for that. <laughs> um, just this, the, the language of spiritual leader and always bringing that to the forefront. Uh, and, and, and like Russ said, that, that leaders versus managers. Thank you so much for that. You're getting some amens in the chat, a couple, couple hallelujahs in the back of the church, amen. <laughs> um, another segue, um, I will kick this um, over to Shannon. Um, how do you present um, in, in practical ways, reform theology, history, polity and and say a little bit about your use of the book of order in in training your elders sure um again i'm gonna carry the banner for theo academy they do some great stuff in this regard and really like they have there's a video that they do on grace hmm. that has sort of become our um you know our mantra because um in it the presenter says something to the effect of, and then grace, bam. And so, so, when, so when we see grace abounding, we kind of do this bam thing. Um, but again, so uh, I encourage y'all to take a look at those if you haven't already. But um, we typically go through the, um, the book of order, you know, on a, on a high level, but that we spend some time with um, how the Book of Order handles theology and the foundations of Presbyterian Presbyterian polity section. It is, you know, the so ripe with good, simple, concise, but also amazingly dreamy ways of thinking about mm -hmm. our theology. So we um, kind of we spend some time unpacking that. And we also, with the Book of Confessions, if we can manage the time well, we will assign the confessions. And sometimes, you know, the Westminster, we kind of break it up. But, um, <laughs> multiple people take pieces of it. And then we ask people to spend time with it, to research, um, and then come back and report what they learned. You know, why, how is this meaningful to you? Um, what um, insight could you gain from that and um, and really let them spend some time in the confessions just exploring them as much as anything and we have found too that that then when we use pieces of any of our confessions that are not typically used you know not the Apostles Creed or the Nicene Creed for instance when we use those in worship they're so much more meaningful Mm. for folks um it's not just a oh, why can't they just stick to the good stuff right it's a <laughs> they uh they really um we get lots of good feedback about that so that's great thank you um others your uh history polity i i uh i kind of do it in uh, bits and pieces over the three or four sessions because we don't use the book of order or book of confessions until the like the third session okay but on the first session i give an overview of church history yes and uh, i do a little bit of theology when it comes to reformation and why 
it had to happen and all of that. And then on the second session, I will, will be, will be doing a little more of the theology part. Uh, so that ties into the first session, but then when we go to the book of order, then we see another view on the same theology. So, so it's kind of reinforcing, uh, uh, that, um, and then, uh, with the book of order, uh, since we already had some good discernment topics in our church, in our session, yeah. I bring those to them and said, okay, this is the, this was the question or this was the issue. Now let's look in the, in the book of order, what it says about our role first, and then what it does about our, uh, how we must go about it. Uh, and then find things that the book of order kind of suggests mm. w when this happens. And then I tie it back to, okay, how are, where are our values for the church on this? Are they, are we keeping up with our values of, and the mission of our church? Yeah. Uh, so that, that's how tied in the book of order uh, piece is, is more on the practical aspects of, uh, of, uh, of the life of the church and life of leadership. That's awesome. Um, Russ? Well, for us, uh, when it comes to creeds and confessions, one of the things that I always like to point out to them is. Russ, are we, I think. Uh, Russ, I'm going to stop you for a second if you can hear me because we're losing you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hear you fine. We can't we can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm gonna go to oh, the next one. Okay. <laughs> we, we can hear you now. You just you, Oh okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Um so for for me with the book of confessions, one of the things I like to always point out to the elders, and it makes them dig into it a little deeper, is that these documents were written to solve a problem. Hmm you know, somewhere in the life of the church. And, and what that also does is it helps them see the progression of the church as we look at the progression of the documents. And then it invites the opportunity of what would our confession have to include? Yeah. If we were to write one today. Um, as far as the book of order, of course, with our new form of government, I always invite them to recognize it is now permissive rather than prescriptive, but it keeps us from having to reinvent the wheel. Mm. Uh, and so if we've got something that we're trying to figure out worship wise or any other way, let's look at it as, a, as the resource it's intended to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I'm, I'm also thinking about context where, um, to Hodari's point that some folks are coming from different backgrounds and just really don't know what it means to be Presbyterian and to be Presbyterian in the 21st century. Um, and so I, I made up when I was pastoring, Hodar is kind of more multicultural, but similar to your context. Um, we just had a class called "Being Being Presbyterian, Being Christian," and you guys remember those the books we had in seminary that it had like the church history charts and the theology charts, so you could be like, "All right, consubstantiation, transubstantiation," like you know, you can see it all um, in that way. I really think that those are helpful for not only elders but also for just the church in general to understand who we are and how we fit in history and in time and kind of where is God taking us today. So I found people who had been third, fourth generation, you know, Presbyterians were like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize we believed that or I didn't know that there was a, a confession for that. Like, oh, thank you. So sometimes it's reteaching. Um, everybody has a chance to, to relearn um, and to go in that way. Um, I am mindful of the time and I, I want everybody to kind of chime in on on this, what I'm calling the bonus question. Um, what is your hope for elders once they are trained and as a step into their role as, as new leaders in the church? What is your hope for, for those newly trained elders? I'll jump first on this, Aisha, and it's language I've used a little bit in the meeting already, but my hope is that they will truly lead like Jesus. Hmm. Uh, and what I mean by that is that they will invest in others to invite others into ministry. Yeah. If, if they do that above anything else, 
they've been a successful elder. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I'll tag on to that. That's exactly where I was headed, Russ. Um, and that then they, um, they discover gifts and talents that they didn't even know that God had given them, perhaps, and and then lead the congregation in discovering their own, right? And so how do we individually and collectively use all of that to um, so that people, you know, know, love, and serve Jesus mm -hmm. in all kinds of places? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. How oh, darn Yeah, I, I, it is my, it is always my hope, number one, that they come to realize they possess all they need to do the work that is before them. Um, I think it was Olive who, who expressed the trepidation that comes when they are um, newly elected and wondering whether or not they can fulfill that role. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing is, you know, and I often give the analogy of, 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 a, of a bee pollinating uh, flying around that they would take that energy and just you know, allow other people within the congregation to blossom and bloom because of uh, their leadership um, and and that they would share what they have uh, with the rest of the congregation that's a part of our blessed bloom become um, motto at new life so that is that is the ultimate hope uh, that they'll begin to do that that kind of work with the congregation I love that image, it's sort of the, the pollination is like the blessing, like they've been blessed and how can they be a blessing um, to others in the congregation and in the, and in the world. That's awesome. Alex. Um, Aisha, I think your shirt says it all, actually. Yes. <laughs> That's a big question. Um, once, you know, once they kind of sign off on those uh, vow questions, a lot of it to me comes down to that one. Um, you know, from here on out, are you going to serve with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? And to have, you know, part of it is that that energy and that sense of passion about what they're doing. Um, but passion by itself is not going to get the job done. That mm -hmm. that's great. Um, and I hope I hope all of them are passionate about what they're doing, and they're excited, and they're happy, and joyful about what's going on in our church. But on some level. I also, you know, the, the intelligence and the creativity and coming up with ideas and new ideas and um, that kind of stuff. And then, um, you know, the big one at the end is love. And, uh, and we close all of our session meetings with a, a time of, of prayer and prayer request. And some of those are personal items and some of them are, um, you know, things that uh, they're aware of going on in the congregation, you know, a particular couple going through a hard time or somebody's gotten a diagnosis or something and lifting all of those folks up in our prayers, um, I think is a big step towards uh, that love piece. So Thank great you. shirt. Yeah, I was, that was my uh, my subliminal. I was like, who's going to realize that I'm wearing a constant uh, ordination <laughs> vow question on my teacher? Uh, that's sort of, that's sort of my, my new clergy clergy gear. Um, Juan. My hope is that the elders embrace uh, who they are, not only as uh, just as uh, members of the church and leaders of the church, but as uh, who God has called them to be as elders. It's not just a job or a position, it's a calling. And uh, my hope is that they can, uh, when they finish their, their terms, that they can live uh, faithfully stronger mm -hmm. and uh, with more love and more willing to serve uh, rather than tired mm -hmm. and tired of session, burned out from session, even if it's just three years. Uh, so um, that's my hope is that they can live excited and stronger in, in their faith. I love that. Juan, that is good. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, especially the not, you know, what do you hope that they don't, they don't do, right? Like they don't get burned out, they don't get frustrated, and they don't see this as a waste of time. Like they really see it as like, wow, God is really, building me up and I'm living into, into my identity as a, as a disciple and, and a disciple in, in this role in the church. 
Olive, please, what is your, what's your hope for your elders? My hope um, is that, that they would commit to continue learning. Mm. And um, I, I often ask them the question, you know, how would you feel if the last book your pastor read was when she graduated with her MDiv in 2008? Come on now, preacher. Come on, you preaching now. And <laughs> they're like, um, we don't know how we feel about that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's how I kind of get them to realize that the same way that I am continuing to learn and study, um, you know, and committing to that growth yeah. that you too have to do it. But, but I also need to be the one that's providing the resources. So mm -hmm. I understand that I could encourage it, but I've also got to be the person initiating and providing those resources for my elders. Um, I, I can't leave it up to them, you know, completely. So, um, yeah, um, every now and again, we commit to um, purchasing a book and, you know, probably discussing just one particular chapter. Read the whole book, but let's come and, and discuss one chapter so it's not overwhelming that we've got to do a study of an entire book. Well, it's also, I mean, learning and growing together. I mean, you know, Alex, when we, did, when we did our little Pat Lencioni book. I, you know, I bought the, the trainer's guide and the, the PDF. <laughs> and I paid my little money for the big notebook, but it was sort of like growing together. And, you know, then I figured, you know, there's a podcast with it too. So it's sometimes when you provide the resources, you're growing with your congregation as well. And this is not just your leader has to do it, but we're all kind of in this together. Um, we have about eight minutes left yes. on this call, and um, there is one question in the chat um, from Erin. She says, it sounds like um, you do training after the elders are elect elected. Does anyone find it beneficial to train them before they begin service? Um, again, I think this goes back to some of what, Hodari, what you've been doing or what you've um, experienced. Just to clarify, obviously they have to get trained after they're elected but do you train them before they start service or after and is anybody seeing it beneficial to do it beforehand in in our model the new officer training happens before installation and ordination service so they do have the foundational training beforehand um and as i said the retreat actually which is the visioning group building all of the other components all the heavy lifting out of it happens and leads into their first session meeting. So but they've, already, they've, they've been ordained and installed the, the weekend prior to the session retreat. That's right. And it sounds like also Aaron in the chat, Alex is saying that for practical reasons, um, they, it seems like they do it after, after, am I saying that right, Alex? Yeah, and can I, can I ask a question too? Because um, for us, the practicality is usually our, our slate isn't full until sometime in October. And so even when like Presbytery has offered a joint officer training, it's usually in October and we don't even have our folks elected yet. So, mm. and then, you know, by the time they're elected, then you're going through the holiday season. So we end up training them in January. Um, but backing off from that, you know, my question for y'all is uh, in order, you know, if you do want to get them elected earlier and do some training before the holidays hit, when do you do, the summer's not really always the best time to be calling around. So when do you have your nominating committee begin their work and when do you try to have it done? So we, as I said, do our, um, officer years based on the school year. So they are ordained and installed typically on, um, on Pentecost. Uh -huh. um, and then we, you know, back up the training from there that, and usually they are elected in February. So, but we do try to um, start in late fall. So it does back up again, as far as the getting the um, nominating committee together and that sort of thing. Um, so we do overlap with holidays and such. And, and a lot of times, to be honest, it is, we're up to the wire on, mm -hmm. <laughs> on that um, election date, um, the nomination and election date. So, but that's how we run it. 
if that's helpful at all. The nominating committee is for us is supposed to, I'm gonna say supposed to, um, start in uh, the latter part of uh, August and begin their um, interviews and all of those pieces in the month of September and be done by October. Um, and that gives us an opportunity um, to be prepared for the training and then installation come January um, and not be disturbed by the November and December months. That has not always happened um, because there have been times where we have not even um, gotten the number of people um, <laughs> who, who desire to be to be elders. So that has sometimes pushed it back. To the other question someone asked, we do an orientation and that orientation, I'll be honest with you, much of the material covered in orientation for folks who are interested in being elders um, is also a part of the elder training. So they get a, a piece of it um, prior to um, the actual full-fledged PowerPoint presentation uh, that I think I'll change up this, this time around, but I've been journeying with that for quite a while, adding to it, uh, but trying to find another creative way of, of engaging them. That's great. That's great. Alex, in, in answering your question, we actually begin with the nominating committee in January. Um, and the January process is to train the nominating committee on what their task is to find as, as has been said throughout the call, and I think you probably brought it up, we're not looking to fill slots. Right. We're looking to call elders. And so the first probably three months our prayerful discernment through the membership. Mm. Uh, you know, we're not talking to anybody. We're generating a list of who do we feel has the right gifts, has the sense of call, and then we start reaching out. Having said that, like every other church, we're still down to the wire trying to get them trained in November to get them ordained or, you know, elected in December. Got it. Got it. So that's how you run your cycle. That's helpful. Well, we are almost at time. We are, you're getting- I have a question for the Presbytery. Yeah, uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, the, the process of, of elders is, is, is great. I love it, but I'm often um, curious because sometimes, uh, as far as Gump said, um, session is like a box of chocolate. You never know uh, what you're gonna get. <laughs> um, can you share with me successful and healthy models um, in this current context that um, that show church growth and not in terms of numerics, but how beneficial have this model is this who who critiques this model and how this model functions and works um, and just someone coming from education into this sphere, having to work with a staff um, as opposed to a group of elders that changes over a period of time. How does that impact the trajectory of the church? Who looks at those particular things? Who studies those and who, what can you share with us um, in, in this process? Because I'm always curious as to uh, which, who out there has really honed in on how a session can really help propel a church forward um, in, 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 this, in this current current era. Without putting my stated clerk, I have some thoughts, but without putting my stated clerk on the spot, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> and it can be at a later date. I just, you know, if you could share it, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I, that is such a great question, Hadari, and, and I think worthy of another conversation entirely. But. And I'm assuming that you're talking about the pandemic. I mean, is is in terms of this current context? Is that what you're referring to, Hadari? Um, just in this this generation, this is a leadership model that has spanned across um, generations, and we're now in a different type of environment, uh, millennials and all that. You know, so how does how is anyone right sizing this to this particular moment in, in history? Donna, I can't think of a space where, like I think about all the mid-council emails that I get, all the stuff we get from 
Tricia, to the council leaders, I can't think of anything that's saying, you know, we're looking strategically at, at, <laughs> at how we're structured and how we make decisions. I, I've never heard of that kind of conversation. Well, I haven't either. And I think it's a real tension in the denomination. And I think one of the um, illustrations of that is the whole discussion about eliminating synods, which has been going on now for mm. 15 years. We can't figure that out. I mean, I think that our structure, this is my own personal reflection. I think that our structure is really hindering um, moving forward in the church. There are some definitely good things about it, but I think there's some things that we really need to to look at and be challenged uh, for the church to move forward at this point in time. But I can't tell you where any of those conversations are happening, Hodari, because those that are entrenched in it are really having a hard time having a conversation about it. I, I, maybe Aisha would agree based on what we're not even seeing out of mid-council conversations. Right. I, Could I add a Macedonia Ministries, while they're not specifically Presbyterian, of course, um, has a lot of good conversation about this, Hadari. And mm. they have a, a an email that they send out called um, Leadership Conversations, I think, and I can put the link if you if anybody wants that. Um, but they're doing a lot of fruitful conversation about about the church and and the power of the church and um, and in these days. So um, I'll add that to the chat. Yeah, that'd be great. Chip? Um, I, I just wanted to throw in that um, I think what Donna was talking about <clears throat> was the hope for the uh, 2020 vision task force that the General Assembly appointed in 2016, I believe. Um, we can argue whether or not they were successful in, in getting to the root of any of that, but, but that was a hope from that group. I would, I would also say, um, hold on, are you familiar with FTE, right, Forum for Theological Education? They're having conversations as well in the same way that um, Macedonia is around leadership, around design thinking, um, and all that kind of stuff. I will say that um, what, I, what I am finding in kind of younger mid-council leaders or folks who are newer to these roles are just constantly asking the question about interpretation. So say nothing changes in the structure. I know when I was, um, when I was a solo pastor, again, in a context not much different than yours, um, there's a book that I use a lot called The Prayer Saturated Church. And in that book, she talks about having prayer ministry teams. It's, it's almost like a, like a multi-level marketing kind of thing where the, you know, this person has a team and, and that person has a team. And so that it, within our polity, what I created for my committees were team captains and had like a whole little chart to say, so here are our elders who rotate out, right? And treated the elder as a liaison to the committee to say, you're the, you're the, the elder and the deacon. It was a small, you know, it was a, like it's a smaller church, but you're the elder and the deacon committed to this ministry. This person has the actual spiritual gift around education. So this team captain is kind of making sure the mission of the, of, the, of the committee happens, but the elder is the one that's responsible when it comes back. And so there was more like, how do, how do you keep this interconnected, keep the mission and vision of the church going, even within our polity? So I, again, I have not seen anything where anybody's trying to flip it on its head, but they are asking questions about what is interpretation and how do you have people in, in alignment? I, Another book that is my favorite is Simple Church. Um, I think that's by Rainer and Geiger, if I'm saying that right. But that's all about clarity, movement, alignment, and focus. And so even side by side with the Book of Order, what are the ways to interpret it so that you have the kind of teamwork, design thinking, and leadership stuff that we're seeing in so many other different <laughs> areas uh, you know, of what's happening out in the world? I don't know if that helps at all. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it does. It, it does in an environment where people see it as um, not something that's 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 mandated, something that serves as a tool and a resource. And I'm speaking in particular of the Book of Order, and I don't want to belabor the time, sure. but I'm looking at it in the in this current context. You know, people in my generation and many folks that you know don't have the time. Mm -hmm. that sometimes we used to expect of people who served on session. 
um, just in general, our meeting times have had to look different. And I'm so glad we went to Zoom before the pandemic. Um, now we're really seeing that this is a way we can effectively work and get some things done. Um, so with that being said, how have we right-sized the structure of the church and the expectations of session uh, to say that that is an option, that is an opportunity to readjust the way in which you're working? Um, and all those resources are great, but again, I think what you just told me is how do we interpret the Book of Order to fit those particular models that are out there? And I think that's a discussion that would be helpful for a lot of church leaders who are struggling because people come to the table and say, Pastor, I just, I don't have the time. But I'm like, you have all the gifts. Please mm -hmm. find some way um, <laughs> to, to, to get involved. Um, and, and that becomes challenging. But then I get the person who is retired and can sit at home all day and there's no offense to them, um, but they come with those 50 year old ideas. Um, and, and it, it creates you know, a very a huge challenge for the church to move forward. Well, and on top of that, Hadari, I mean, the three year model is ridiculous in today's time and age. People don't have three years to commit, let alone six years. I mean, it's, it's, it's problematic, I think. Yeah, it's, yeah. So I, I and I, I really appreciate that. And, and perhaps as we are getting through in and through this pandemic, these are larger conversations to have to say, what did you learn being the church behind a screen and masked and distanced? And what are the ways that you, people are being really effective in this season in ways I would have never imagined. There may be a lesson on the other side of this, again, for how we interpret and how we make sense of, of how we live into this while it's in this way at this time. Um, this has been great. You guys are amazing. Um, we are a little past time, but I just want to thank you. Thanks to everyone. Um, thank you, Hodari and Alex and Olive and Russ and Shannon and Juan. I am giving big thank yous. Um, and everyone is saying thank you in the chat. So we will have this uh, recorded and we will share those resources and have that somewhere in our interwebs um, and we'll find a place to put it and make sure that you have access to it. Um, I would like to ask uh, Chip if you would close us in prayer. Sure, let's pray together. God, we thank you for calling us all together and for being in our midst in this time. We ask your blessings on each of the pastors here and each of the churches represented and for all of the churches in the Presbytery that you would continue to um, bring up leaders for your people and remind us and those we work with that our primary job is to love and to serve and that all of the decisions we make and the work we do should be based from there and from the movement of your spirit with each of us and in our gathered midst. Bless each of us, we pray, as we go about the rest of the work of this day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's good to see everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.